Hello YouTube, this is Chance Paladin, and start I start my new job in just under two days, and going over my last couple of little training things that I have, kind of, I know they're nothing major, but I guess it's it's major to some people and not others, but it's it's a good refresher and it's a lot of good info that's already available and kind of in one nice central place. So, um, that being said, let's go over part seven. Um, these sh should be, you know, if these are on YouTube and everything, these should be on a series um, a playlist. So, check out the playlist if you missed the earlier ones. Some of these have dependencies and some of them don't. I think this one stands alone really well, but it explains a lot behind part six when I talk about intentions. And then this one goes as far, too, as to talk about motivations, because I believe intentions and motivations are two different things. So, let's, let's get it on. Okay, intentions are less about the what and more about the why, which is, I talk about that in a lot of earlier uh, episodes, and then think about uh, why the person is playing the role that they are, which I talk about in the last episode or series or whatever you want to call it. Uh, motivations tell you what maintains the momentum towards the why. So it's kind of like, why the why, if that makes sense. It, I know this stuff gets really deep. Um, I get accused of that a lot. But, yeah, each one of these is kind of like further down the rabbit hole. So, anyway, just hopefully you'll stay along for the ride. Um, if this is important to you. Um, so to, to do the motivation, you think about what the person's final result would be. Some people call this like the end game. Like, what would be the person's end game? Like, what do they hope to accomplish? But it's, why do they hope to accomplish that? And then, why do they... Why do they... Why do they want to accomplish... I don't know. I know, it's really deep. It's never... Never mind. Let's just keep going. <laughs> if you want to pause it and think about it, then go ahead. But uh, the introduction... Behaviors and personalities are a really mixed bag... You can take each measurement type, layer them all on top of each other, and end up with something very three-dimensional. And all of the behavior matrices that I've seen, none of them are three-dimensional. And I think that's because they're preaching to a very broad audience with different backgrounds and different intentions and motivations of their own. But if you really want to digest this, you'll see that it is extremely three-dimensional and what what you'd almost have to do is take every single personality test behavior test and then it creates this humongous humongous three-dimensional matrix that that would be impossible for somebody to focus on more than a couple like in their entire lifetime so they make these very high level ones that you can kind of browse through just as a reference so you can keep tabs on some of the most major points but unless somebody's messing with you in which case it's a moving target uh, even like your spouse or brother or sister or child the more they they grow up and develop based on their background and a lot of other debatable topics you end up with this insane matrix of like thousands of points some of which float around on day to day and based on chemicals and food and sleep and all kinds of other things so but you take all that and you say well why do they do it why do they do what they do? And then why do they why do they do what they do? So and then also what are their intentions? Where are they going? And 
That's why you hear, like, in court cases and stuff where some just, like, legitimately evil person did something evil, despicable, unspeakable. And they go, why did you do it? And then the guy just kind of laughs. He's like, you'll never understand. And and there's a lot of truth to that. Because unless you're in that person's mindset, you're never going to understand. And then some people get in that mindset to try to figure it out, and then they never leave again. Because sometimes once you go too far, there's just no turning back. And, and then on the you take that, that criminal mind that complexity and you have that complexity of in a lot of other places in life like these huge you know 10 year long projects sometimes 15 year long projects sometimes the project spans through multiple lifespans of a product they're infinitely complex you know there may be two or three program managers in the case of that time they just each have to keep documenting what they're doing so the next person can pick up where they left off. But every single time you've got to cause an effect. And I didn't come up with this idea just like 99% of these ideas I didn't come up with. But I'm putting it together and I'm putting it in my own words. And <clears throat> nobody else puts all this stuff together. They're each very proprietary and situational and it frustrates me because nobody's ever going to read most of it. There's only a couple pages from every one and you can take it completely out of context and it's still just as useful and it frustrates me. So this, I call it cause, why, and effect and I think there's even a South Park episode where they're like Step one, da, da 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 and then step two is like question marks, and then step three is profit, and uh, and it was weird, and that's why I just that's like the beauty of South Park, and I know a lot of people would freak out like, oh, M G South Park, this and that, and da, da 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 da. There's so many hidden nuggets of brilliance, absolute brilliance in South Park. And, um, because Matt and Trey are absolute geniuses. And whoever they have writing for them. And, and it's, you, you see it. I don't know if this idea is copyrighted or if you can even copyright an idea. But I've just seen this repeated so many times where you have like a point, point one and a point two. And then the point in the middle, like nobody knows. But but it's what you choose to do with this is the question. And do you let it stop you? Or do you dwell on it? You know, or do you just say, we're going to find our way through it, but we at least need to start? You know, wars have been won and lost in this area, but they all knew that they had a goal and they may have not went they may have not gone in knowing everything or they may have been pushed in or they may have thought that the only way was to go through but it was all because of this so it's uh, I mean there's books and books and books and books and books of situations and circumstances but but anyway so it's a metaphor but it's also literal so when you're talking about people specifically there's kind of this three-dimensional if you can sort of tell this is supposed to be a three-dimensional image I had a hard time finding one that wasn't obviously somebody's copyrighted thing but when I was a kid this is always how I looked at the planet like the, the, the planet Earth the planet that we live on right now and 
you know, it's got the crust and the mantle and da 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 da, da and you, you try to dig down, and I always imagine, like, what if you could dig down, but sooner or later you dig down so far, it just fills up with lava, and so there's all kinds of additional complexities, but I look at people like this, too, and, you know, you watch Shrek, and he's like, people are like a an onion, and and the donkey's like, no, people are like a parfait, and Shrek's like, no, they're like an onion. And it's just the honestly, the donkey just really pisses me off. Everybody thinks he's funny, but actually, Shrek is like, I believe Shrek was trying to make a very specific three-dimensional point. And the donkey's trying to make a very two-dimensional point. And I don't know if they did that on purpose or if you just see how the donkey's trying to be smart, but you find out he's really stupid and Shrek's trying to be smart, but nobody understands him. And if you've ever cut open an onion, I mean, this is what an onion looks like. It's three-dimensional. You try to come at it from any angle. And the core is like, buried in the center and if you get down to this either good things can happen or dangerous things can happen and I'm trying to talk to people about psychology it's how you interface with this and you can believe that this is a real thing or a metaphorical thing or metaphysical or whatever but everybody's got one of these and when you hear people talk about they wear their emotions on their sleeve or whatever it means that their core is on the outside and maybe their armor's on the inside I mean this can I'm like waving my hands around which you can't see these can be all switched and swapped around there could be multiples multiple fragile layers or whatever and multiple defensive layers um, so I call this the core, but that's really not quite the right term, but I'm not sure what to call it. It's basically these kind of emotional spheres, and you've got to be careful when you deal with them, because everybody's got one of these, and people like to poke and prod, but they're not paying, paying this respect. They're not some people gloss over stuff and have formalities because they're trying to protect themselves and if you can identify that you need to respect not to poke and prod at certain things and some people recognize this and so they poke and prod more and that's just not right so going to back we're talking about with intentions when you're trying to figure out people's intentions you have to be careful of this and I can't tell you how to do that because it would take hours or months or years but um it's just some people are insanely fragile and some people are insanely tough and I don't know there's words I could throw out there but everyday people are different too and um you just have to be so careful when you're dealing with people because not everybody may be trained to resist and they, and they may not be trained to communicate with you very well that you need to back off and then you may take that personally and that's why I prefer to passively figure all this out and then if you see somebody else getting out of control when when you know they're getting to a soft spot um you can try to intervene to some extent but don't let people mess with each other obviously either because you can have a problem there too you may need to step in if you see somebody getting too close to somebody else and they don't know what they're doing anyway it's that's a tough subject but i hope you get the gist of it this is also kind of a good 
sort of a metaphor for a business hierarchy, like going back to the auditing thing, even though this is very relevant to auditing, you can think of it like a business too. People create these in office settings, but they use people instead of themselves. Like for example, these high level managers, sometimes they have, they have Ad admin assistants, which could still be super high-level managers, or they may have really entitled administrative assistants. Um, I've ran into engineers with really complex auditing backgrounds. I've ran into IT people with engineering backgrounds, engineers with IT backgrounds, and these add a lot of layers. I, I've ran into engineers with like psychology backgrounds. Um, and I've ran into people on the shop floor with landscape design degrees. And I've ran into people with, you know, political political sciences degrees that work in sandwich shops so never ever ever even remotely assume that you know who you're dealing with because these people create layers and boundaries of, of even like literally people around them even entry level um I, I can't tell you how many times you, you could be talking to somebody, think you got a leg up on them, and they could be like the CEO's kid. And, and stupid stuff like that happens all the time. I've heard stories of where a new CEO has come in, and they've changed their name, and worked on the shop floor. For, for weeks, for a couple weeks. Um... And they've worked their way up. Even though they've been the CEO, they've moved from department to department not being the CEO. <sighs> Excuse me, temporarily. So, that's why I say, you know, passively kind of monitor what everybody's doing from like an emotional and a, an intentions kind of oriented level so you can keep, keep all your senses open is basically what I'm saying don't poke or prod if something seems sensitive you know going back to earlier training that I've been talking about it's not always a bad thing sometimes they're just protecting themselves from some kind of hurt or pain or this is just another kind of tool to tuck away while you learn to deal with office politics. And I can't teach you about office politics because they're going to be different everywhere. So, let's see. Layers of emotional roles. I made, I made these up too, but these aren't anything super special. Uh, you find versions of these online. Basically, you've got your over overconfident person. I see this all the time. They they in fact there was this other YouTuber I was watching. He was talking about this earlier. They choose something, and then they just fanatically follow it no matter what, because if it fails, they consider themselves failing. So they just blast through confidently to maintain their momentum and blast everybody that disagrees there's the skittish person that won't commit to anything a superficial person the follower that just goes with whatever seems popular you'll see these people repeat what I call bumper sticker logic like on Facebook <laughs> they just repost like memes that seem popular but they'll have like no idea what they mean they just sound cool and popular and so they just ignorantly 
repost them all the time. Hipsters, I see this misused a lot. I even get called a hipster, but I don't know. There are people go that go around that hate everything that's popular, but don't realize that that's just... They're their own hypocrite, basically. Then there's the cynic. These aren't always the person that's been there the longest, but sometimes they are. Um, I say listen to the cynics, but don't get caught up on everything they say. And then the, the critic, which you'll notice because they never seem to propose their own idea. Probably another name I would have for these would be emotional capacity, maybe instead of emotional roles because this seems to be, maybe not, but it seems to be as, as far as they're able to really think through or work on something. There's, there's more than this, but this just kind of gives you an idea. So I call this uh, unlocking the door. Um, some people will know it as like their aha moment. Um, hopefully, maybe, maybe not you've had one. I remember the first time I, or I remember one, one very prominent time and I shared it with my friend and he shared it with his friends. I was working on CSS, which is called, they're called cascading style sheets. And... I had actually been self-taught uh, how to do CSS and, and then one day like I was doing like the X's and Y's on a style sheet and all of a sudden like it just the whole thing just came into just crystal clear clarity all at the same time and I sat there and just frantically like boom 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 I just nailed this whole thing in just a few minutes it was just amazing like the all the teaching and training and everything all came together I figured the whole thing out and did CSS for like years after that um no 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 sorry um sometimes the door is open but people are conditioned to not walk out, uh, metaphorically speaking. Um, I prefer to call this Stockholm Syndrome. You can go look that up if you want. It's basically when people get so conditioned to be some kind of prisoner or hostage that they start to sympathize slash empathize with the person that's holding on to them. And they, uh, for better or worse... And they begin to take that person's side. They could leave, but they just simply don't want to anymore. So they could theoretically have their aha moment, but still not care. And I see that a lot. Um, people don't adjust to freedom very well. And I, I'm trying not to use tons of prison and criminal... criminal excuse me... Uh, metaphors or examples but it doesn't matter if it's like domestic violence or a child turning into an adult or or an animal that goes outside or maybe an animal that's was in captivity and it got released it's a lot of various i guess prison metaphors but or captivity metaphors but people just don't don't adjust to being free uh, you know, there could be, like, lawlessness and they'll still go steal TVs. Or you give them millions and millions of dollars and they just immediately blow it all, despiting, or despite having such a small budget before. It's like this adaptability and scalability to where it's just a larger place that's still captivity like they don't spread their wings out to like a natural territorial level I don't know kind of like you let the cat out and it stays in the yard instead of establishing its proper normal 
which is good because the cat remains safe, but it's also bad because you could have to deal with other cats that don't respect that territorial boundary. And again, that's why you shouldn't let cats outside, but I'm not going to get into that. So I wrote this whole thing down here. It says, if people are too initially sheltered when the doors open, they may be an equal swing in the opposite direction. Care must be taken to gently open the door and ease people through. Then they must be supported when they're through to the other side. You, you hear that, you'll hear that one saying, like, you can lead people to water but not drink. You can lead them to the water, maybe, and then have them take a small sip and walk them through what they're tasting, I guess, if you want to carry that metaphor forward and explain to them what they're drinking, why they're drinking it. Don't drink it too fast. This is what water is. Just because it tastes good doesn't mean you can jump in. You can't breathe it. Uh, you kind of see those metaphors. you got to be super careful that if somebody comes up behind them with a club saying stop drinking that water now, you've got to be able to maybe defend them, maybe have them explain their side and then if the person continues to have a problem with it then address that separately I mean a lot of domestic violence metaphors there but the person has to be given the tools to to take care of the situation themselves within a reasonable set of expectations so that's why I write, again, just like with any other form of being released from long-term captivity, there must be qualified support network to be there until people can function in the new environment. Another one is uh, coming back from, from military service. Um, another one is if you've been in deep, deep, deep water, you've got to, you know, decompress as you come up, just... You know, there's a lot of examples. So, so what what do you do, or what should you do? Usually, uh, especially as an auditor, I, I touch on this in other ones, but usually people leave clues as to what motivates them on their desk. A uh, picture of a son or you know daughter might mean they have pride in their child. The background being a forest, maybe means that they enjoy camping or hiking, etc, etc, etc. Those are all hints uh, to what motivates them. I list a couple here, but there's a million more. It's going to be a lot of trial and error, making a lot of notes to yourself about which, which sign or icon, token, which one means what. If you see video game posters, like same thing with like desktop wallpapers, some people like might have cars, some like a lot of people like cars, sports teams. Um, I don't subscribe to the whole thing to where you need to learn a little bit about every single sport just so you can talk to people. But if that makes it easier for you, um, I don't want to spend another 10 minutes going into how much it irritates me how hung up on sports people are but spoilers it's way way too much in my opinion sports has no place at work it's simply completely irrelevant to anything work related but people like it and it doesn't hurt anything. So, if if you want to learn a little bit about every single sport, it may help you. E even if you are anti-Second Amendment, anti-military, you really need to learn a little bit about every military service because you're going to be dealing with military people because or ex-military because of all of the wonderful wonderful vets that have served our country and are now employed 
get out of my serial cat. And when you're speaking to a vet, you need to not sound like a complete and total idiot. And you need to be extremely respectful. So learn about uh, vets and what they do and what they've done. And learn how to tiptoe around politics. Extremely carefully learn how to tiptoe around religion. So you don't say something stupid. And just learn how to digest those clues. Now, if you've got a completely bare desk, which can actually be more common now that HR departments are cracking down, or if they've got some policy of desk swapping, desk sharing, which is becoming a lot more common, you... If you're going to be spending a lot of time with them, you may want to take them out to a coffee if there's a coffee shop or, or lunch. Um, get them away from other people and then listen to their concerns. Even if it sounds, like I said, even if it sounds foreign or uninteresting, everything's interesting. Even if they're saying nothing, that still means something. Um, do your best not to ask co-workers except as a last resort try to start with their last manager if they're still with the company unfortunately we seem to be in a retirement in a retirement phase right now and talking with prior managers may not always be possible if you want to learn about somebody's intentions or motivations direct approach is usually worded well it sounds weird but they're called one-on-ones it, I know that sounds absolutely weird, but trust me, most managers will know what you're talking about. It basically means that you want to talk to the manager with no distractions, and, and it doesn't mean that you're in trouble or they're in trouble, that you have a problem or they have a problem. It just means that you want to have regular, standard, normal communication. And managers, I'm talking to you guys too, make sure you're having one-on-ones with every single one of your employees as often as is needed or at least once a week, honestly. Um, it's super important that you stay dialed in, especially if you aren't lucky enough to have all of them super close in the office or if people are working off-site. And, and there's tons of great training out there that already exists for how to deal with, how to make sure it's a positive and not a negative that they're working from a longer distance, so. If you need to recognize them in public, which I believe is my next training presentation, you need to be extra cognizant of all of this. and learn, make sure you learn about them and their needs and wants, desires before you just go recognizing them. And that'll be a good segue into the next presentation. So, just to recap, until, and intentions tell you why people are doing what they're doing even if you don't like the answer. This knowledge allows you to address the thought process behind others and your own actions kind of like holding up a big mirror. Knowing people's intentions and their motivations will allow you to tailor recognition and incentives to maximize their effectiveness and prevent wasted opportunities. And and yes, my, my next presentation will dive into recognition because this one's intentions and motivations which leads into recognition if you have to give recognition or when or if you should or whatever so thanks for watching i'm gonna uh stop this one here and check out the next one if you want to know more about recognition or if you don't like how you're recognized or if you have to recognize or want to recognize other people okay so thanks for watching and i hope you guys uh, find some value in these. These are very high level, but at the same time, 
they go deep in places so lots of great training and learning materials out there and if you work for a decent sized corporation it's possible that they already have learning materials on a lot of this and it's possible that it's part of your normal development program to get a couple training classes a year so if any of this seems interesting to you definitely talk to your HR departments uh, to get some more education but above all else just be aware and empathetic and cognizant of your coworkers. Um, a lot of people say that they are but if they say that there are, they're usually the most disconnected people. And they're... Yeah. So just be aware. Be aware of everybody around you. Okay? Alright. I'm going to let you guys go. So uh, take care of yourselves. Alright? Thanks for watching.